In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. What's going on in here? Just a woman having a baby. I was born in 22. My father was a rural mail carrier, and my mother, uh, they were both uh, college educated people. My mother uh, was a member of the school board. Uh, well, I said, when I, I remember when I was a little tiny, very little tiny kid, she told me that she says, Well, Claire, uh, when you were very small, you asked me, Why is a drop of water round? Exactly 58 years later, on June 11, 1980, astronomer Carolyn Jean Spellman Shoemaker discovered asteroid number 2511 at the Palomar Observatory in San Diego, California. She named it Patterson in honor of Claire Patterson and his achievements. On the same night Patterson wrote a little poem, Shine little asteroid, glitter, glitter, in small circles, tumble, tumble. This film will tell you his story. I'd like to start this interview. I'd like to start this interview. I'd like to start this interview. Patterson. 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 Well, I was uh, born in a small town in the middle of Iowa that was located in the midst of uh, farmland. In this little town uh, where I grew up, it was sort of a, the, the uh, boyhood at that school. It was a small school, and the teacher would uh, say atrocious things about <laughs> that were totally wrong. And then I would get up and give a little explanation of how it really was. But the teacher, the science teacher, would say something about electricity being a fluid, you know, and I had to explain to him about electrons and all this sort of Each person had a uh, had a certain characteristics, and we accommodated ourselves among and within our tribe but, but to those various kind of characteristics. Mine was that I would get up and explain how things really were. They didn't resent this; it was all part of the whole deal. Oh no, that was accepted. It was taken for granted. Loved physical that chemistry. was accepted. They said it you was taken for go. granted. Where was all that uranium coming from? If it could be demonstrated to be a worthy thing, it was about four miles away. How old were you then? We were between eight and twelve years old. Yes, we stayed there. Doing that, we learned about plants. It's a small shotgun. That was accepted. It was taken for granted. Hundreds of thousands of fires repeatedly receive up to the minute information. 
on weekends we'd go to the river bottom and stay over it was about four miles away and learn how to swim and fish we built fires and cooked the fish that we caught uh, we were between 10 and uh, between 8 and uh, 12 8 and 12 years old so we uh, we learned how to to hunt we our parents gave us not rifles but shotguns and little tiny they call 410 it's a small shotgun that wouldn't carry very far and wouldn't hurt very much so we hunted rabbits and squirrels uh, with we learned how to shoot weapons and, and shoot animals But when the mouse was given a mild electric shock as it approached the cheese, it responded by running back. After this procedure was repeated for some time, the mouse began to associate the cheese with the electric shock. And because he was afraid of the shock, the mouse was conditioned to be afraid of cheese. Now, he responds to cheese as he would ordinarily respond to an electric shock. That's what we call conditioning. We hitch up a stimulus, the cheese, with a new response. Must be pretty hard on the mouse, but it doesn't happen to people that way, does it? brother and a sister. My brother was a champion athlete. I, I was always different than most uh, <laughs> most of you. Then I had an uncle who uh, gave me his chemistry uh, laboratory workbook from, from the college and from then on I taught myself chemistry. Did you have any brothers or sisters? Oh yes, I had a brother and a sister. My brother was a champion athlete. So he wasn't interested in the chemistry set. No in the way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. He was a champion basketball star, and uh, uh, my sister was, uh, and all this other stuff, uh, girl stuff. So there was never a question about that you were going to go on to college when you finished. So, oh no, that was uh, taken for granted. If we can pour out our troubles and unhappiness to a sympathetic friend or a member of the family, then we can avoid keeping such things tied up in ourselves. It sounds like you had wonderful parents. Well, I would say the situation is, is not... <laughs> they couldn't have done that way in a city. It was more... it was a social context also. This was uh, 43, 1943 and 44. We got married uh, when I was in graduate school at the University of Iowa. Lori and I became bonded uh, in college. I helped Lori. She would drop things in the laboratory and fumble around. And I, so I <laughs> was very good in the laboratory. But she got honors and I only got superiors because I wouldn't do the homework. I wouldn't do the, I was always wanting to do what I thought was the right thing to do and I wasn't going to do what, what the rules was. Uh, I wasn't very renegade again. We got along very well in, 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 in science. She took chemistry and physics together with me. She would drop things in the laboratory and fumble around. Maybe she did it on purpose. But she got honors, and I only got superiors, because I was the renegade, again. Lori 
Mary, I love you. Pat, I love you. Lori, I love you. Pat, I love you. Lori, I love you. Pat, I love you. Building our nation, guarding its security, assuring the future of America. You can roughly locate any community in the world, somewhere along a scale running all the way from democracy to despotism. One to the democracy end, another somewhere in the middle, and a third. Let's find out about despotism. This man makes it his job to study these things. Well, for one thing, avoid the comfortable idea that the mere form of government can of itself safeguard a nation against despotism. Pat felt he was the only young male on the streets of Chicago. Maybe this he did right during the war. Years. Pat felt Pat he was the only was young male on, on the streets of Chicago. This is right got during the war. Years. Years. Nine months. This was 1943 the genie out of the bottle. The genie out of the bottle. Let the genie out of the bottle. Was Lori getting a master's degree also? No, she was, uh, she was working uh, to pay our expenses, I think. I can't remember. Pat and I left Iowa City to work on the Manhattan Project in 1944. Soon after we were married, we were unhappy in the city, doing work we thought would let the genie out of the bottle much too soon. In the late summer of 1944, we returned to Iowa for a weekend for Pat to enlist in the Army. He had applied once before, during our senior year of college, but was rejected because of nearsightedness. Now, however, the physical requirements had been lowered and he felt he would be accepted. Pat felt he was the only young male on the streets of Chicago and was a draft dodger. The colonel suggested that he send us to Oak Ridge, where there were many young people. There was a chemistry professor at University of Iowa who said, Patterson, You've got to go to the University of Chicago and work on the atomic bomb. I thought it was such a big secret. Nobody oh, <laughs> it was only a secret by to to chimpanzees that didn't know what they were doing. It, 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 no, no. And there was a chemistry professor at the University of Iowa who said, "Patterson, you've got to go to the University of Chicago and work on the atomic bomb." And I went back to the draft board. My draft board. I says, "I want to go in this army and get killed." And they said, you got to go in the atomic You can either go in the atomic bomb as a civilian, or you can go in the atomic bomb in the Army. If we draft you, you're going, to, you're going down there. I didn't have too much to say about it. We agree that capitalism is an economic system, a system for the production and distribution of things we need and want. I won't agree to that. Not until you say something about government, too. There has to be a legal basis for any economic system to operate. Well, it's easy to see that you have different ideas of what capitalism is. Maybe we should talk about what it is not. It is not a system of strict governmental control and planning in which a dictator or board tells people what jobs they may hold and, and what goods they may produce. And it's not a system of government ownership. Let me tell you about something. It shows that the basis of the capitalistic system is private property. They get everything they want by pulling strings, or rather by having somebody else pull the strings for them. All these motions are the work of the artist who manipulates the control stick, a twist of the wrist, tension on the string, a crook of the finger or gentle swerve of the arm, and our gay figures perform cleverly for the delight of beholders.
More than 300 years ago, the first pioneers crossed the oceans to a new world, a promise called. We went down to Oak Ridge, and that's where we spent another year and a half or two years, because this is where they're making the atomic fuel. Lori and I worked in separate laboratories, and on weekends when we had off, we'd travel, we'd walk up in the mountains behind, over, and we would see the people who lived, had been living there for 200 years. I mean, these, you call them hillbillies, Hill but they, their say. annual income was two or three hundred dollars a year. Well, anyway, uh, the essential thing was I learned uh, during that time ideas and concepts and patterns of thinking. These mentors, these professor mentors, who were no longer in the university but working there, they conveyed to young people like me that uh, this is the thing to do. Patterson, we are saving democracy for the world against fascism. They knew that they were working as engineers uh, on a hideous weapon of warfare. This is London calling. Here is a news flash. The German radio has just announced that Hitler is dead. I'll repeat that. The German radio has just announced that Hitler is dead. At a cost of two billion dollars, the atomic bomb. This is your form. What is capitalism? Let the genie out of the bottle. Let the genie out of the bottle. Let the genie out of the bottle. When, now, when the war ended, Libby, Brown, and all these guys, a whole lot of them flocked back to the University of Chicago, and all these ideas that had been cooking around their minds during the war then came to fruition. These were uh, scientific concepts that dealt with uh, atomic physics and chemistry. The symbols of atomic energy are becoming increasingly familiar to all of us in this age of the atom. Inventions pertaining to atomic radiation, like the nuclear reactor these technicians are working with, are bringing scientific achievements undreamed of a few decades past. Okay, so when I went back, Brown uh, found out about me, and he said, hey, Pat, uh, look, you're familiar with mass spectrometers, and if we only knew what the isotopic composition of primordial lead was in the Earth at the time it was formed, we could take that, stick it into this marvelous equation we had, and T was the unknown there, and you could turn the crank and bump out would come the age of the Earth. The age of the Earth was what was known before uh, World War II. It's a sort of mystic uh, number, but you know. I said, good, I will do that. <laughs> you know, he said it will be duck soup, Patterson, and you'll be famous because you measure the age of the earth. And you'll be famous because you measure the age of the earth. Measure the age of the earth. And you'll be famous because you measure the age of the earth. Lori, Lori, I love you. I love you. Pat, Pat, I love you. I love you. Lori, Lori, I love you. I love you. Pat. Pat, I love you. I love you. And then Harrison got uh, offered a big job over here at Caltech, and uh, he brought me along with him.
Yeah, he's a duck soup, Patterson. And you'll be famous, and you'll be famous because you will not measure, you will not measure the age of the earth. I said, I said, I will do that. I will do that. Do you know? Do you know? He said, he said, it will be done. It will be done. Patterson. Patterson. Within the hours, flags can fall off the line. The flight bombers made ready from the old order book. In one day, a thousand acres one can dump 30,000 bushes. In one, one plant unit, not enough rifles to put out of entry. The men who in one day might well or lose it. How will let the state and the country make fake of rifle trees for me? The team, one of the girls, she's caught it. There were tens of thousands of published numbers of lead concentrations in these common, ordinary things. They were wrong. When uh, we knew the age of this rock, and I would be working on the, on the, on the lead in there, and we knowing the age, we'd, we'd compute how much, what the, how much lead should be there and what a cytostatic composition. Not right, Patterson. There was lead there that didn't belong there, and it was more. Where did it come from? Well, it might come from this. It might come from B. It might come from C. You know, uh, pig pen in uh, Charlie Brown's uh, comic, little pig pen, where yeah. the stuff is coming out all over the place. Well, that's what people look like with respect to lead. Everyone, but I used immediately used their new technique Equipment. in my new laboratory to push down the contamination control and the amounts that we're working with, and that was how I was able to get do this iron the lead from the iron meter successfully. And this was in 1953. This was the first measurement of the age of the earth that was published. One drop on your skin of pure lead tetraethyl will kill you. It passes the, the membrane that gets into the brain and it poisons the brain and it takes about two or three weeks and you're dead. One drop. I wanted to look at the, uh, the record in the uh, recorded. Where do you see that record? You see it in the snow that never melts in the polar regions. It comes out of the air that has lead in it, lead's in the snowflakes, it goes down, and you have a layer there. Next year you have another one. And Harrison said, oh, heck, the oil company should be interested in this. So it will help you locate and identify uh, uh, oil deposits. One thing is certain. It is these research activities sponsored by American industry that have brought us this far and will continue to create further progress for us. And the industrial scientists and engineers are the pioneers of present-day America, the creators of progress, of new industries and new jobs. Train your son in the laboratories of American industry to see what's ahead. It's a bewildering future, all right, not because there are no new frontiers, but progress. <laughs> convinced the oil companies that they should finance my research, which had nothing whatsoever to do with oil in any way, shape, or form. Where, Where do you see, you see that record? record? You see you it, it snow snow that never, that never melts, melts in the polar, in the polar regions. regions. I started working in the uh, up north, in the North Pole. There was some big drilling, and we had to dig shafts down, you know, two or three hundred meters long to go back in time to get these blocks of ice over a period of time to see what was happening. So we were looking at this stuff, and then a very bad thing happened. Uh, we were studying the sediments, and we found from the sediments, measuring lead in these sediments, and I came out with a number that was a hundred times greater than the amount that we had measured was flowing through the oceans in the past. All right? Uh-oh, something is wrong here. Or is there really that much lead 
coming in the oceans today. We found a huge increase in the upper portion of the oceans, which decreased to lower concentration, much, much lower concentration with depth. Ah, uh, why is that? same time worked on one problem. One problem at the time was that of engine knock. This was a loud noise made by the engine that indicated a loss of power from too rapid ignition of fuel. The motorist wants smooth, controlled application of power. Using a special demonstrator, I shall show the difference between poor performance and good performance. Now, with the hard face of this mallet, I strike the piston. The piston you see receives a punishing rap, showing how power is wasted when gasoline knocks. In addition to fashioning the molecules to prevent fuel knock, refineries usually add minute quantities of tetraethyl lead to help accomplish the same purpose. This model shows how just the right amount of fluid containing tetraethyl lead and dye is added to the gasoline. Competition, profit motive, private property. And what do they all add up to? Free enterprise. Well, that's what capitalism is. A system of free enterprise. I wrote a big paper, and I said, this lead is coming from lead gasoline. Blam. You know, it was a consortium of oil companies. It was, oh, I can't remember the name. It was some, some big, they stopped my research over wham not only did they stop block stop funding me they went <laughs> they went to those parts of the what was this called uh, oh they tried to get the atomic energy commission to stop giving me any they were still giving me some money then they, they went around they tried to just block all my funding but i'm so stupid i didn't know what the heck was. i couldn't i couldn't do anything about it okay harrison could have but he was out of it then Turn that thing off for a second. Sure. Would you please get you? start worrying about science instead of this health crap. I mean, come on, Patterson. I mean, what a waste. I mean, here he is, you measured the age of the earth, and you're worrying about tetraethyl lead, you know, and, and this stupid stuff about lead in bones. <laughs> Could you learn to handle your trains more carefully than that?
gasoline. Powerful stuff. Modern magic. Our lives, our business, our cities are patterned on motor transportation, which gasoline has made possible. Hi, I am John Scannery. I work for General Motors. Hi, I am Thomas Midgley. Pleased to meet you. Shall we form a company to produce leaded gasoline? Great idea. I have an idea for a name. Really? Yeah. The Ethel Cooperation. Sounds cool. Okay. We should also have a company song. Oh yeah. There's a difference, a powerful difference, between gasoline and Ethel. Many observers have found that two workable yardsticks help in discovering how near a community is to despotism. The respect scale and the power scale. A careful observer can use a respect scale to find how many citizens get an even break. As a community moves towards despotism, respect is restricted to fewer people. A community is low on a respect scale if common courtesy is withheld from large groups of people on account of their political attitudes. A power scale is another important yardstick of despotism. It gauges the citizens' share in making the community's decisions. Communities which concentrate decision-making in a few hands rate low on a power scale and are moving towards despotism. There's a difference, a powerful difference between gasoline and ethyl. Gasoline. And you know what? Two thousand years ago, they knew lead poisoning. Uh, I mean, they 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 could associate ill poisoning effects with lead. But do you know who was affected by it? The slaves working in the mines and smelters. And who gave two hoots for those slaves? Getting let out of gasoline, same thing. Each company's objective is the same. Discover a new product, perfect it, and put it in production before the others do. They start with competition. What they create is progress. What, what, what was your motivation at this point? Were you thinking in an environmental sense? No, I was point. not. Science, science, science. You're just doing science. I okay. wanted to know. My work was used to get lead out of gasoline. Uh, that's when I really, really got shot down by the lead, they, lead companies. They, they wanted to really, send, they wanted to send me to the moon. Before, all they had was people were being poisoned in the factories, you see. There's poison in the air we breathe. There's poison in the river. The fog and smoke There's below poison in the air we breathe. There's poison in the air we breathe. There's poison in the river. Smoke below. The, the government was below taking below elaborate below. precautions, forced to pre prescribe, when they started doing this in the 30s, and uh, elaborate precautions how to protect people making this lead tetra. Do you realize one drop on your skin of pure lead tetra will kill you? One drop. <laughs> and you know. People wash their hands and this stuff. And you know why they don't? That in it, because it's more soluble in the in the oil, the gasoline, than it is in the lipids of your skin. So that's all. And you only die slowly from lead poisoning. A lot of uh, the gasoline is dangerous, and the people who handle the gasoline. Anyway, so the government was protecting these these workers, and that took care of it. I mean, it was only the manufacturing process you worried about the the toxicity of lead tetraethyl. For heaven's sakes. Once it's out, it's in gasoline and it's oily stuff. And you don't. Do you know when the when you ship lead tetraethyl from these factories, it's handled just like it's a poison gas weapon? Were you aware of that? With the tradition of pioneers behind us and better facilities ahead of us, future progress leading to still finer products is assured. So there's the story, folks. And I'm proud to be a part of it, even if only as a tiny atom inside modern gasoline.
People say our gasoline is toxic. That's rubbish. I know, but what can we do about it? I will put my hands in our leaded gasoline and show the world that it's fine. Yeah, do that. <laughs> Here it is in our food. This has been measured. I measured some of it. And here is the ratio in us. Now it so happens that lead is in our bones. And you know that the ratio of lead to calcium in people was about the same as that in rocks. All right. Now I compared that with barium. I said, now look, we are being poisoned by lead. And guess where it is coming from? It's coming from tetraethyl lead. There were no basic complaints as to wages, hours, and working conditions. There were minor complaints. You can roughly locate any community in the world, somewhere along a scale running all the way from democracy to despotism. It's mystique of power. It's mystique of power. The best concentration of economic power in all embracing corporations does not represent private enterprise as we Americans cherish it and propose to foster it. On the contrary, it represents private enterprise, which has become a kind of private government and is a power unto itself, a regimentation of other people's money and other people's lives. More power to you, President Roosevelt. The entire country's behind you, thrilled with hope and patriotism. He supports labor unions. He is taking away our profit. Let's overthrow him. One of the U.S. Marine Corps' most highly decorated generals Smedley Darlington Butler, by his own account, helped pacify Mexico for American oil companies, Haiti and Cuba for National City Bank, Nicaragua for the Brown Brothers Brokerage, the Dominican Republic for sugar interests, Honduras for U.S. fruit companies, and China for Standard Oil. General Butler's services were also in demand in the United States itself in the 1930s, as President Franklin Delano Roosevelt sought to relieve the misery of the Depression through public enterprise and tougher regulations on corporate exploitation and misdeeds. No more mourning, no more mourning, no more mourning out to while. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. Take my place with those who love and fought before. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. Take my place with those who love and fought before. But most people just don't realize how much hard work, knowledge, and money it takes before gasoline can come out of a pump and into the tank of an automobile. Why we think and do these evil things. And that's what it lies behind the story, and that's why I'm in human consciousness today, because I look at this picture and I ask, why did we do that? Pat, why do you do that? Look, I'm stupid, all right? I'm not some brilliant person or whatever. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little child. I can, I, like, you know, the emperor's new clothes. I can see the naked emperor just because I'm a little child-minded person. I'm not smart. I mean, good scientists are like, they have the minds of children to see through all this facade of all this other stuff that, that they know is stupid nonsense. They don't know, they just don't see it the way other people see it. I know, sometimes a man has to do what a man has to do. They might try to kill you. No way. Never the sheriffs showed up.
soldiers, they all carry guns. It was very much a part of the almost mystique of power that was frightening and controlling. I'm truly thankful for the peace of mind that Dad's job brings, for knowing that even though there are lots of luxuries we can't afford, there still will always be enough to go around for the things we have to have. I'm glad Dad doesn't work slave hours, that there are evenings and Sundays and vacations when we can all be together. And I'm glad that that freedom we've got lets me choose the kind of work I like and can do best. Taking a sluggish motor and making it hum again. Makes me feel that somebody got to his work, or wherever he had to go, just because of me. And feeling like that gives me a lot of satisfaction. Today we say goodbye to Thomas Midgley. Thomas Midgley got killed by his own invention. He gave us leaded gasoline and was also responsible for the invention of Freon refrigerant for refrigeration and air conditioning systems. He was born in 1889 to a father who was also an inventor. In 1922, Midgley discovered that the addition of lead to gasoline prevented knocking in internal combustion engines. The company named the substance ethyl, avoiding all mention of lead in reports and advertising. In 1923, Midgley took a vacation to cure himself of lead poisoning. One year later on October 30th, 1924, Midgley participated in a press conference to demonstrate the apparent safety of TEL. In this demonstration, he poured TEL over his hands then placed a bottle of the chemical under his nose and inhaled its vapor for 60 seconds, declaring that he could do this every day without succumbing to any problems whatsoever. A few months after his demonstration at the press conference, Midgley saw treatment for lead poisoning in Europe. In 1940, at the age of 51, Midgley was left severely disabled. This led him to devise an elaborate system of strings and pulleys to help others lift him from bed. This system was the eventual cause of his death when he was entangled in the ropes of this device and died of strangulation at the age of 55. God bless his soul. before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men, which would be able to take over the functions of government. A Congressional Committee ultimately found evidence of a plot to overthrow Roosevelt. According to Butler, the conspiracy included representatives of some of America's top corporations, including J.P. Morgan, DuPont, and Goodyear Tire. In the last few weeks of the committee's official life, it received evidence showing that certain persons had made an attempt to establish a fascist organization in this country. There is no question that these attempts were discussed, were planned, and might have been placed in execution when and if the financial backers deemed it expedient. Let's relocate our companies to Germany. Yeah, let's support Hitler. Yeah, 
Let's support Hitler. He will protect us against communism. Hitler needs our lead and gasoline. His tanks and airplanes cannot run without TEL. But we have to be careful. I agree. Here's an idea. We have General Motors by German car manufacturer Opel. Yeah. And let Opel keep its name. Exactly. But really it is General Motors. But we have to be careful. And Standard Oil works with E.G. Farben. We will give our synthetic rubber patents only to Hitler. Cheers to Hitler. the meaning of this in terms in the in what how, how did we think so we're looking at one of the world's greatest evils I mean what led us to poison the earth's biosphere with lead you see that's what I so that then I was therefore uh, shifted to to uh, trying to figure out how we thought Midgley for poisoning the planet with TEL, but you did much worse. You built the atomic bomb. But that wasn't me. They were already set to go. All I had to do was light the fuse. You know that isn't the entire truth. You were ambitious. And now you have a problem. Well, now how shall I solve this problem? You can't. You follow the serpent because you wanted the apple. You will always feel guilty. You must feel depressed. I'm very, very depressed. I'm a uh, manic depressive, of course, because I... That is hilarious. You are a depressed scientist, and he is a dead engineer. You guys make a great couple. <laughs> Thank you.
We say we live in a capitalistic society. What does that mean? Well, we can point to certain fundamental ideas which we say are part of a capitalistic system. For example, private property. Individuals or corporations may own land, natural resources, buildings of all kinds, machinery and equipment for the production of goods, facilities for the transportation of goods, and the goods themselves. In a capitalistic system, these are usually private property. Progress, 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 progress. Some young man, perhaps one watching this very picture, may develop a startling new formula from a test tube experiment, may give the world finer things to use, to wear, to better man's health. In this new world of industrial chemistry, the horizon is unlimited. Unexplored potentialities beckon. Hidden secrets of nature sound a call to this young man. Blam. No, it was a consortium of oil companies. It was Blam. Oh, I can't remember the name. No, it was a consortium of oil companies. It was They oh, stopped my research. Some Blam. dig. No, it was a consortium of oil companies. Wham, 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 And here are the news for his method to use carbon-14 for age determination in archaeology, geology, geophysics, and other branches of science. The Nobel Prize in Chemistry is awarded to Willard F. Libby. Hello? Who is calling? Patterson speaking. Willard Libby won the Nobel Prize. Good for him. Well, uh, half a century ago when I came here, uh, I had a reverent regard for the Nobel Prize. I'm a very withdrawn person. You saw in my office here. It's a right. wall, double door, double windows, and uh, Everything is double, no sound whatsoever, whatsoever, it's quiet. These guys, uh, Nobel laureates, and I, I had, I regard, I knew that they were good scientists and I respected them, and therefore I respected the Nobel Prize Nobel because Prize. of that, okay? Uh -huh. But this award of, uh, this, this, these, this award in honors business, uh, I'm just not, I'm not, I just, Okay. I have zero pride in any award, okay? All I feel is obligation, obligation, obligation. Maybe that's his trouble. He's so used to being a winner. He's never learned how to be a good loser. Well, the best place to get things on your mind is off. That may not be good English, but it makes good sense. Well, losing was a new experience for him. Negative. Negatist. My work has been recognized uh, they've named a, uh, a an asteroid after me. What what is the meaning of this in terms in the and what how, how do we think? The, the the new concept is one is a utilitarian type of thinking. The other type of thinking is you're not in conflict. With it. You're trying to. You're trying to come up with, try to understand and ask why, why? Not how can I solve this challenge, but why is that? Why is a drop of water spherical?
Patterson speaking. Should old acquaintance be forgot, and never brought to mind? Should old acquaintance be forgot, and old lang syne? For old lang syne, my dear, for old lang syne, we'll take a cup of kindness yet, for old lang syne. Okay, how much longer do you want to go? Well, here? we can go to the end of the tape. Okay. Well, how long is the end of the tape? How 45 many more? minutes. How, uh, how long have we gone? I don't know. I have 4.30. What do you Oh, have? okay. Well, let's, let's finish this story and then call it a day. Okay? All right. In this interview in March 1995, nine months before his death, Claire Pat Patterson, professor of geochemistry, emeritus, talks about his early interest in physical chemistry, his education at Grinnell College in Iowa, his stint on the Manhattan Project at Oak Ridge. He came to Caltech with Harrison Brown, who established a geochemistry program in the Division of Geology. By 1953, having measured the isotopic composition of primordial lead and iron meteorites, Patterson was able to determine the age of the Earth at 4.5 billion years.